This presentation was recorded at MVC Comp. For more content like this, go to www.mvcconf.com. JetBrains, the leading vendor of professional development tools, now offers a range of new products for .NET developers. In addition to ReSharper, the top class productivity extension for Visual Studio, you can now use .cover to run coverage analysis for your applications, .trace to find performance bottlenecks, and use TeamCity and UTrack for a perfect combination of continuous integration and issue tracking software. Go to www.jetbrains.com for more information. Hey everybody, this is a live uh, presentation, so thanks for your course. So uh, let's uh, just get started. So as uh, previously stated, welcome everybody to the MVC conference. Uh, my name is Roberto Hernandez, and I'll be talking to you today about MVC extensibility. Some of the extensibility points I'm going to be touching on are exclusive to MVC2, but some of them have also been around since uh, MVC version 1. And some of them, of course, are not exclusive to ASP.NET MVC. Some of them can be shared with our ASP.NET uh, web forms body. So, uh, Let's go right ahead and try to answer the question that I bet is on everybody's mind right now. What is this presentation all about? Well, in a nutshell, this presentation is about learning some of the basic MVC extensibility points by refactoring features in existing code base. Um, some of those features are already implemented in the code base, so we're basically going to be uh, refactoring them to make better use of the MVC execution pipeline. And some of those features we're going to be implementing from scratch. But um, the benefit of basically learning the MVC extensibility, uh, extensibility points and is to allow you to create a better application. And what does that mean, at least to me, it's uh, you'll be able to build an application where you're going to have clear separation of concerns. It's going to be an application that's going to be easier to manage, easier to test. So it's going to be an application that's going to make your ha client happy in the long run and in the short run, hopefully. Uh, that being said, the application that we're going to be looking at, which is uh, what's actually highlighted on this next slide, uh, it's a working application. It's a contact manager, very uh, lazy one. It's version minus one, at least that's what I uh, called it since it's a demo application. And it allows for basic contact management. You'll be able to uh, track persons and associated emails to them. It does have some very fancy but basic features. It allows you to export the list of persons that you're managing in RSS, XML, or JSON format. And it uses some of the new MVC2 model validation features. It does have some obvious code smells and pain points that are actually visible as soon as you start browsing the application. There's a lot of spaghetti code in the views that we're actually going to be refactoring um, by making better use of the extensibility points that the view has. We're also going to be um, refactoring some of the port design in the routes that exist in the existing application, uh, therefore making it a bit more SEO compliant. And our controllers, to steal a phrase from an earlier presentation of the day, are pretty much fat, so hopefully we'll make it a bit thinner by the end of the presentation. <clears throat> so, uh, this slide in particular um, is a bit of background uh, to the whole topic about extending, extens extending ASP.NET MVC. Um, to fully grasp the MVC extensibility points, you have to have a somewhat uh, grasp on the whole execution lifecycle of a request in ASP.NET MVC. And there are some major players, of course, that uh, take part in the ASP.NET uh, MVC execution lifecycle. But as any other web application, it is based on a request response interaction between a web server and a client application, which is usually browser. So the key players in the whole process are going to be the routing engine. The routing engine is the one that's going to be building out the request context that's going to be passed along through the whole execution pipeline. That execution context is used by the uh, MVC handler to instantiate a controller via the controller factory, another major player in the execution lifecycle. And the controller at that point is basically going to rule the execution lifecycle by executing its action methods, all action filters that are associated to it, and it's going to produce an action result that could be uh, output in the form of a view to a browser or to, uh, in the form of data via JSON, RSS, XML, or any other data uh, format type to a client application. So 
this is more like an agenda, if you want to look at it from this perspective, of what are we going to be doing in the presentation. We are going to be tackling uh, the different extensibility points from left to right that are defined in this diagram. So from the point of view of the routing engine, we're going to be, a, a, um, we're going to be implementing the custom routes that, all, that basically define how a request is mapped to a controller. We're also going to uh, enforce custom constraints on those routes to have a more granular control on how those requests are incoming into your server or maps to a controller. Now, from the controller perspective, we're going to be uh, basically modifying the way our controllers get instantiated. At that point, we'll probably be writing our own controller factory to basically define how our controller is instantiated and define how the dependencies that it needs are uh, instantiated as well. We're also going to be building action filters to decorate the work that our controller is doing. Um, two clear examples that come to mind and are going to be part of the demo. We're going to be building logging functionality. We're going to be building caching functionality. And we're also going to be building an action filter that determines the output of the controller, the output format. We're also going to be talking, when we talk about the controller, about uh, model validation and model binders. And the reason for that is the model doesn't really have a uh, place where it lives in this whole execution process. Since the model is, in most cases, uh, built by the model binding process that um, the controller invokes, and is passed to the view. So you'll see that, for example, things like model validation, I have marked them as extensibility points for both the controller in terms of what it can do in terms of uh, validation, and for the view in terms of what it can do for, for example, client validation on the browser. Uh, one last demo that I plan to do before the end of the hour is I want to implement a custom view engine for you guys, a very basic one. Uh, basically, a one that's going to be token-based instead of the traditional uh, use of um, ASP.NET web forms, uh, C Sharp, Visual Basic Code to present data. Now, this slide right here is sort of like uh, simplifying the previous slide, just a different perspective. And it's a bit more to the point of what we're going to be doing. So again, not to get lost, not to dwell too much time on theory, I'd rather be writing code for you guys. Uh, we are going to be working with the routing, with the, with the routing engine, with the controller, with the model, and the views. And we're going to be extending it um, as it relates to the execution pipeline from the request uh, start to the response end. So the first extensibility point that we're going to be uh, talking about is the routing engine. And the routing engine itself is uh, not as specific to the ASP.NET MVC framework. That's why I specified that the ASP.NET routing engine allows the developer to extend uh, the execution pipeline by defining custom routes. Those custom routes are primarily um, entries in the table route that defines how an incoming request maps to a controller. You can also define custom route constraints and that only uh, enhances the capabilities of uh, uh, matching uh, through rules defining code the incoming request to a controller action. The code sample that's on the slide is uh, very common. It's the basic uh, route table entry for the ASP.NET MVC application as uh, it comes out of the box. So the default route is basically one that has first parameter controller, second parameter action, and third parameter an ID, which can be optional as stated in that, uh, um, in that code statement that we're looking at. So that brings us to the first demo. And uh, let me open my virtual machine just to... So hopefully at this point everybody's watching my virtual machine, which took exactly longer than it was supposed to to come back into the screen. So uh, let me just browse the application a bit because I want to highlight what this demo is all about. This is the application. It's uh, currently running in Cassini, the web dev server. And as I mentioned before, it's an application that's a basic contact manager application that uh, we're going to be managing persons and we're going to manage the contacts associated to it. I believe that I, oops, yeah, that's uh, part of what we're doing in the second demo. Um, that 
right now some of these persons do not have any uh, mapped uh, resources to them, so let me just go ahead and click on uh, uh, one of these different mappings. For example, if we press on the, um, let's say the XML one, we should be getting the XML list. The same thing should apply to RSS or JSON. We should be able to get RSS and JSON for this link, but since this demo is about routing, let's focus on that. The other feature that this application has that is sort of fancy or will be fancy by the end of this demo is we can filter the uh, person's list by birthday. And in this case, since I want, didn't want to invest too much time on the demo, I basically uh, made a birthday action on my controller. The birthday action, if you notice when I click on the link and get the uh, URL on the top of the screen, basically has a uh, uh, three parameters that are in common, a day, a month, and a year. And while at first glance this is not obviously a problem, it doesn't seem like something that we want in an application that's going to be exposed to the Internet, that's supposed to be SEO compliant, and that's supposed to expose an API that is discoverable, if that's what we want to accomplish. So first thing first, I'm going to define a custom route that's going to make this route look a lot prettier. Let's do that. So by default, all entries in the routing engine are usually inserted during the application start process. In this case, what I'm going to do is define a custom route for this application. I'm going to give it a name. That name should be unique. Let's say it's birthday route. I'm going to pass the pattern that it should be matching. In this case, it's very specific, so let's just say person slash birthday slash, and I'm going to use the month day year format. Now, I need to specify how that's going to translate into routing tokens, so let me just say the controller map is going to be person, the action is going to be birth date, and the rest of the parameters, um, for now, I'm going to say that they're optional. And that should be enough for now. If I compile this application and simply go back to the list of uh, persons that I had on the previous screen and just browse over the, um, hold on, I should be seeing a change in how the links are being generated. Now, apparently it's not happening now, so I'm going to verify what I did wrong in the code. There we are. For some reason, apparently the compilation or the caching in the browser was being a bit naughty. But as you can see now, the uh, um, uh, links that I'm getting are in the format that I expected them to be. So when I click on this user, I can see that the filter that was being passed is basically person, birth date, month, day, year. Now this makes our API a bit more discoverable. And just to move along, since we lost a couple of seconds when we started this demo with the whole uh, my VM was in the wrong monitor thing, uh, let me just go straight into a problem that I'm currently looking at. Uh, 
this route is great. It defines the value and it maps them correctly to the controller action method. Let me just browse to that so you guys can see what the controller's signature is. It's uh, basically just the day, month, and year associated to the values. And there we go. Uh, birthday, day, month, and year. So it's pretty straightforward, but what happens if I pass, for example, a day 32, or a month 13, or a year 3000? How is my application going to react? Well, if I do that at this point, what's going to happen is I'm going to get a nasty error from my application. And that might be um, what we want. Hold on, let me mess a bit with the months. That might be what we want, but uh, we certainly can do a much cleaner work on um, making sure that the parameters that are passed to this control reaction methods are mo more well constrained within the valid values. So at that point, what we're talking about is basically a route constraint. And so uh, what we're talking about at this point is a route constraint. We're basically going to say, yes, this rule is perfect. We want to be able to pass a month, day, and year to our controller. But we also want to be, be a bit of uh, uh, more strict in the sense that when a month goes in, it cannot be over 12, it cannot be under 1. So how do we do that? The easier way, and I already wrote that class, is implementing a custom route constraint, which is just an implementation of an I route constraint. In this case, it only implements the match and receives the HTTP context, the parameters, uh, as a route value dictionary. Uh, the code is pretty straightforward. We're just going to say, for the month, I want this to validate, and I have an enum here that defines how the validation is going to take place um, from 1 to 12 for the day from 1 to 31st, and for the year from 1950 to current year. And this code definitely is not perfect. I mean, I'm not taking into account leap years. I'm not taking into account um, uh, months that have 30 days, months that have 28 days. But it's uh, definitely worth a demo. So going back to the routing, as we're defining it in our global SX file, we can pass an additional parameter to specify the route constraints. Now, in this case, I'm going to be saying for um, month, I want this to be a new date route constraint. And I want this to be month. We could do the same. And it's probably easier if I just Uh, sorry about that. Let me just uh, go ahead and do it the, the right way, the hard way. And there we are. All the route constraints have been assigned to month, day, or year. So when the routing engine encounters this route, it's going to say, uh, according to the pattern that I've been provided, this route matches a specific control method. But according to the day route constraints, my month needs to be within the range of 1 to 12. The year needs to be within the range of um, 1950, I believe, to the current year. So let's test it out. What will be the difference in terms of the error I get? Uh, if I play with this again, or just hit enter, be nice if I compile, though. So 
I should be seeing a whole different error. In this case, I'm getting a 404, which again, we are uh, defining a route for or a specific action method, but we're being smarter about it. We're saying only respond to requests that we know have the appropriate data type, and we are enforcing that through a route constraint. So that is the very basic but very powerful way you can actually implement extensibility at the routing level. Now uh, let's move to the second uh, extensibility point. And remember that we are going from left to right in terms of the pipeline, so now we uh, did some extensibility work in terms of the routing, now we're going to do some extensibility work in terms of the controller. And in terms of the controller, there are actually four different parts that are actually customizable or extensible. The controller factory would definitely provide us with the ability to uh, plug in code to manage the instantiating of, of the controller and its associated dependencies. Uh, if it rings a belt, we're talking about probably dependency injection. In terms of the controller action invoker, which we're actually not going to demo, but it's a very important extensibility point, we can manage the execution, uh, modify the execution pipeline for MVC as it relates to the controller. Um, action filters and actual results, action filters to provide functionality that decorates the um, functionality that your action method provides. This is usually very um, good for implementing things like caching, logging, um, monitoring, if you have code that does that, uh, into your application. So action results, which will be the last part that we're going to be working on in terms of the controller, define how the result of your controller is actually executed and eventually, if uh, necessary, represented as a view. The most commonly used action result is definitely the view result. That's the one that gets represented and handled by the view engine. So let's do the first demo. Let's talk about uh, improving the existing code base by basically using some um, uh, dependency injection via the controller factory. A lot of people on the, uh, that are probably in the audience right now recognize what I'm doing right here as a poor man's dependency injection. I basically have an overload of controllers that basically inject the iRepository, inject the iMapper. And for very simpler applications, this might be the case. Uh, uh, this might be a good solution. But if you're building an enterprise application, this probably wouldn't be the way you want to handle this. So what you would probably end up doing is just leaving the more ambitious uh, constructor, the one that has the most parameters, that defines all the dependencies that your controller has, and basically uh, modifying the way your controller fa factory works in order to instantiate your controller. The default controller factory will not work at this point. It will try to locate the uh, uh, controller with no parameters, and at that point will simply say, I couldn't find a controller to fulfill this request. So I did write a very lazy structure map controller factory. Uh, having said that, it probably doesn't take anything fancier than this to do its job. Uh, basically, we are overriding the default controller factory and overriding the method that's called getController_instance. At that point, we're trying to get the instance from a structure map. And if we are unable to do so, we basically uh, reach, oh, sorry, we are able to do so, we return the controller. If we're not, we basically call the base functionality. The reason why it's very important to call the base functionality if the um, if the attempt to instantiate the controller is not uh, uh, done correctly, is because the base controller factory has a lot of the plumbing that's, that's, that works around uh, representing 404s and 401s to your users. So you want to make sure that you do not uh, um, basically put, uh, put yourself in a corner where the errors that are going to be returned for your MVC applications are not uh, common and um, basically interpreted correctly by the clients. Having done this, the only thing that I would need to do would be to go to my global ASX file. And again, a lot of things in MVC applications are configured during the application startup. There we are. And I should be able to, if I haven't done so before, uh, to register the controller factory. So 
right here during application start, let me just go ahead and say controller builder dot current set controller factory. And in this case, I could probably just go ahead and do structure map controller factory. And that should do the trick. Uh, I'm not going to run the application. I'm just going to keep on working on the demos and the code that we have. We'll definitely find out if what I've just done is not working during the next demo. So there's not really any use in me running the application right now. So back to the slides. Uh, at this point, we have already managed how our controller has been instantiated, how its dependencies are getting passed along to it. Uh, at this point, we want to basically see what can we do, what can we delegate outside our action method, and what um, functionality does the ASP.NET MVC uh, framework and its lifecycle provide us in order to defer some activities that are not as specific to probably what the controller is doing. In this case, I'm talking about probably implementing some action filters. Action filters come in different in four flavors, of course. Flavors, uh, action filters that allow you to define authorization rules, action filters that allow you to define um, actions that are to be performed before the action method is executed or after the action method is executed, before the, view res the action result is executed or after the action result is executed, or in terms of uh, exception handling, you could also write filters to handle exceptions. And writing a uh, action filter is trivial and easy to do. Let me just skip right ahead to the demo and just uh, implement some sort of functionality that's going to be sitting outside of our normal activity within our, our controller. So back to the virtual machine. Hopefully it will behave a bit better than it has done in the two previous uh, times we have tried to use it. So this is my basic email controller. And uh, well, let me do it at the person controller. And again, I'm going to take the same, the same action I did on the other one. I'm going to remove the less ambitious controller. So I'm deferring to structure map in terms of uh, do your thing. Bring me your dependencies. I don't want to know about it. Simply build me my controller and pass me my dependencies. So for this index action, which is actually the, in the case of the application we're working with, it's the main screen. Just so depending on the type of application you're building, this one in particular sounds like a perfect candidate for it. The information that is being rendered in this uh, view will probably not change over time. So some of the basic functionality uh, for extending a view for some uh, enterprise features, for example, caching, are already built into the framework. So you could, for example, use the default output cache attributes to specify, in this case, let's say uh, cache for, and I believe 30 is in seconds, uh, cache for 30 seconds, use the um, vary by parameters all. So we're, st we're telling it only execute this uh, action result if the parameters that are passed to it have changed, in if it's not, uh, if it hasn't been 30 seconds since the last request. Now, this is pretty straightforward. Again, it's part of what's being added to the framework. So we didn't need to write any custom functionality to extend this basic uh, action method and what and the work it was doing. Uh, one thing that it doesn't have right now is I don't know when this method is being executed. So I might want to implement some logging. And why not? Let's just go ahead and add a class for logging. And let's say that I want to create a log. A logging action filter. Uh, let's just say logging filter. So 
So uh, just to expedite a bit, uh, since we're running low on time, let me just get, I already have most of the code that would actually be needed to implement that. Let me just go ahead and pick it up from here and we'll discuss it. Uh, so basically we have a class log execution attribute, that's the name that I'm probably going to be giving it right now, that inherits from an action filter attribute. Let me just make sure that those using statements are properly added to my application, and there they are. And it uses log for net and an iLog to basically output some information regarding this action what's executed, which action was, at this point we just get the information from the route data that's part of the filter context, and we also not just pass the date and time and log that info. I already did all the work of plumbing log for net to work in this application. There's a um, logs folder that's seen here that's actually been capturing data since we first started, and if I add Going back to the person controller, that lock execution attribute, it should start recording every time we hit that index. So let me just refresh this page a couple of times. And that's probably enough. And the information that I currently have in this general, there's going to be a ton of and hibernate stuff. Uh, the file that I used, I didn't clean it very well, but you can actually see that there's uh, info information being added uh, for the action itself. So we have already done a lot by implementing these two action filters. We have this, we have implemented functionality for logging. We basically now know every time this action is executed. And we could record uh, the exact parameters that were passed to it if we wanted to implement some sort of raw replay functionality in case we had a bug. We also have implemented caching by basically using functionality of the built-in action filters. Now, Another thing we can actually do, but we'll leave it till we discuss action results, you can actually modify what the action does after it has completed. Remember that we said that an action filter can handle events for uh, prior to the execution of an uh, action method and after. That's uh, the action um, the action filters. So let's go back to the slides for a second and talk a bit about that. So we accomplished two of the tasks that we had on this slide. We implemented caching and logging using action filters in a relatively easy manner. The caching, we use existing functionality in MVC. Logging, we just use additional, uh, we build a custom action filter to do so. In this case, an action filter. Now, we also want to build an action filter that does a bit more than that. What I want to step into the next uh, topic before we talk about that, and that is uh, a bit about action results. Now, action results determine what gets done with the information that was provided from a controller's action method. The most common one is the view result. The view result basically has an execute result method that says, hey, the information that I'm receiving from the controller will be associated to a view and rendered to a browser. But that's not um, necessarily the norm. We could be building an application where the request is actually for data, let's say in XML or JSON format, and it has to be formatted to the browser somehow. Well, the way that is done in the application right now, if we take a quick look at it, we're probably going to be able to see it in this uh, uh, method that I definitely think is a bit fat. Uh, during the execution process, we determine, hey, is this an ADEX request, or is the format JSON? Well, if it is, then return a JSON action result. Don't return the view result. And while this works, I mean, if I go to the browser and request JSON, I am going to get JSON back from, uh, and let's open it with Notepad. I am going to get a JSON representation of the object that was passed. I don't think it's optimal that we manage uh, the output results like we're doing it now. 
So one thing that we could do, and that is part of building a uh, more robust functionality in our application, let's take advantage of the action filters, let's take advantage of the action results, and let's build something better. So let's say we built an action filter to basically manage how the output is rendered to the client. And again, let me just go back to my machine, and I do have some code ready for that. And in this case, I'm going to call it output format attribute. Uh, same things as before. This is actually going to be a uh, class that's going to inherit from action filter attribute. We're going to say after the action executed, we want to do something. Now, let, let me be clear. It's after the action executes, not the result. So at this point, we're going to be able to say, hey, you might not be a view result. You might be a JSON request. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're basically saying, hey, if uh, the client has requested through this uh, query string parameter that the format is JSON, then yank the view result that you have right now, which is a view result, and replace it with a JSON result. Uh, allow a get, this is for uh, basically saying that you allow gets to this, to this uh, action method when requesting JSON. And this is the data that we're going to be passing in. Finally, we replace in the filter context the result. So all the code that we currently have on the controller that does that, we could actually jank. And say output format attribute. Oh, sorry. That's, uh, that attribute is definitely not it's redundant. So. Now we don't have the code within the controller. The controller just builds this view. And to those of you who saw the presentation this morning by uh, Jimmy Bogart, we could also build an action filter to um, yank the responsibility for mapping from the uh, action method. But for simplicity's sake, let's just keep it this way for now. And let's see if the application behaves the same way. Now. If I hit the JSON again, I'm calling the index, I'm saying zero, I'm saying the formats equals JSON. And if I click it, I should see the same thing. So I'm seeing a JSON file that's going to be uh, uh, opened in Notepad, and I'll probably be able to uh, use that JSON data in whatever JSON parser and JSON uh, or, or language that can consume JSON. So. Um, now, this first demo, even though it was about action results, we're now using the JSON result, which is built into the system in a smart way. Uh, we mostly coded, again, action filters. And that felt a bit awkward. So let's just write another action result that we can actually feel more comfortable in saying we are extending something. So for example, we currently have the functionality in the application. And let me just browse to it again to provide output in RSS format. And there are many ways we probably could have accomplished that. We could have probably built an RSS action result, uh, which is what we did. Or we could have simply uh, inlined the code within a controller to produce that RSS feed. Now, needless to say, inlining the code is not the smart solution. Uh, if you look at the code within this uh, action method, you'll see that it's pretty fat. Uh, in fact, if I browse to the application, I'm going to see the results. And the execution is going to be the same. I mean, nothing is really going to change. But it's just the fact that we can make this a whole lot simpler by simply implementing an RSS action result. So let's look at that implementation and see what I had to do to make that happen. So 
So the code is pretty straightforward. We are using the syndication feed. We are using the RSS to zero feed formatters. These are all part of the service model dot syndication that we get as part of 3.5 service back one, I believe. So uh, we, we do have a lot of good stuff within the framework that allows us to build a feed and to output it to a browser. Uh, and all the work that this is being, that this is doing, basically I'm passing a lot of funds that allow this action result to get to the title, to get to the content, to build the URL, are basically stuff that are now in line with it, within this uh, action method. So if I wanted to do the same thing, but not have so many code in line, I could probably just delete all this. And basically just say, that this action method now returns an RSS action result. This RSS action result, uh, I have to know it, it's not part of the basic control functionality. Uh, we'll have a URL, we'll have a title, we'll have a description, we'll have a collection of items, in this case the persons, and the person title is uh, the last name and first name being concat. The content is actually the concat of the uh, contacts, in this case the emails, and the, um, the URI for it will be the detail page for the um, person. And this is actually working the way it is now, so if I just go ahead and click on the RSS feed, I should be able to see the RSS subscribe page that Mozilla provides for us. Now, uh, this concludes the part on action results. Hopefully you can see that there's a lot of value in working with action results. Uh, also, the presentation that, w that uh, was done this morning by Jimmy Bogart actually highlighted a lot of other cool stuff you could do with action results. So, let's uh, move on. To the final parts of this presentation, we have now gone probably uh, three quarters of the way on the execution pipeline. We have already modified the way our controller works, we have already modified the way our controller gets instantiated, and we have already modified the way our routing engine does its job. But we now have the model and the view to contend with. And we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to basically cut down a bit on the functionality that I have for the demos. But in terms of model validation, one of the most powerful things that provided MVC2 is a way to extend the custom build validation that's in the framework itself. And the easiest way to do that is basically just write custom validator attributes that could be uh, run both at the client and the server. You could also write your own custom validation engine, and um, my advice would be don't. <laughs> it's a very complex task unless you really, really need something that's uh, uh, very particular to your business needs, then you should probably find something out there like Fluent Validation or XVAL or or you could probably use the default MVC2 validation engine to do what you need to get done. So let's get right ahead and do a slight demo validation. Again, I'm probably going to have to cut the demo short, but the basic demo that I want to provide you guys is in terms of model validation, in terms of extensibility, we could implement custom validators. So uh, right now this email controller allows you to create an email. And there's certain coding here uh, that basically asks, is my model valid? And right now we're really not doing anything that um, ensures that the model is valid. I mean, we're asking, is it valid? But if you look up at our view model that's actually being sent to the page, there's nothing in it that really states this needs to happen. So a lot of things that I probably could do, and this is probably for UI purposes also, I could say I don't need to display this person ID, so let's say that one goes away. But it is a required field. The same thing could probably be said for the ID, and the same thing could probably be said for the email address. We're going to say it is required, and guess what? Apply a regular expression to it, and I do have some Constants, I believe, find somewhere in here. Yep. Yeah. 
so that I don't really have to do this. So pattern that's the pattern, and let's just say error message, error message, have global constants, and that's the error message. So a big now we have to enforce validation for this object. We have uh, defined we want it to be uh, within a specific pattern. We have defined it, it is required. But this is to talk about extensibility. So what can I do beyond that? So beyond that, I could probably say, hey, let's implement a custom email validator. And let's call it that. Let's say, hey, I want an email attribute that will be used for validation. Let's just call it uh, corporate email. The reason why it's a corporate email is because what I'm going to be enforcing, actually, is going to be, does this class um, contains text that is my validation domain? So things that I need to implement, I need to inherit from a validation attribute. So corporate email attribute. And I need to override the is valid functionality. Now, obviously, I need to tell it what is the uh, corporate email that I want to validate or find within my code. And let's just say corporate email and set a variable to it. So how do I know if my uh, object is valid? Well, there's some... I mean, some pipe code that needs to be put in place, some guard code, sorry. If the value is null, I'm going to say true. That's what the uh, require validator is doing for us. I don't need to second guess its work. And let's just say that email equals value as string. And if email equals equals null, then I'm also going to have to say it's true. Again, being empty is OK. So the final thing I'm going to be, have to say is, does the email contains, and in this case, let's say Excel.com. Oops, sorry. Let's say the corporate email. So at that point, I can use this corporate email attribute. Now let me see. Uh, it's neat to specify the Excel.com and compile it. So if I go to my um, form for creating persons, for creating emails. I'll have a field for email address. And at this point, if I hit create, it goes back, it tells me, hey, this is required. It does that validation on the client. We could extend our corporate email validator to do that also, but I don't think we have time to do so today. So another thing I could do, I could tell it, hey, how about if this is uh, yahoo.com? And this is going to go out to the server. But it's going to fail on the field email address is invalid. Hold on. Yeah, the reason why we're not getting a very clear picture on what the error is, we forgot to override this guy. And let's just... Let's just say for now... In that format, you have to be a member. And there. And again, this is just so we can tell the difference between what the require validator was doing and the custom validator that we're defining is doing. So at this point, if I click Create, um, Compilation process probably still running. Mm. 
Yep, I get the custom validator mirror that's associated to that field. So a bit silly of a um, uh, demo in this case, which is validating that all emails enter are part of the corporate domain, but it might be valid. It might be the requirement of an, of an application that's out there. So the part that I'm not going to be able to do uh, today would be extending that into client-side functionality, but that's also something that you can do when you're using uh, or extending the full model validation functionality. Now, the last part of the presentation, and uh, um, it's not necessarily a long one, it's about views. And there are things that you can actually do with a view. And the first one that I would actually like to highlight is you can build HTML helpers to actually improve the default Web Forms view engine. Uh, the recommendations on that is, for example, if you look at my master page in this application, you'll see that I have a ton of spaghetti code actually within the view itself. And to some people, that might be OK. Um, sort of like on the border on this one, if it's truly a UI concern, then I don't see anything wrong with having code in the view. In this case, I have a function. That does feel like a bit of a stretch. If you have a function in your view, then you're probably better off having a controller, uh, an HTML helper method you can test in isolation. And this is the spaghetti code that I was referring to, which basically has a ternary operator, and it's basically outputting is this elected, is this not. So the right way to fix this would be creating a uh, many light and extension method. And I actually already have one in place that will make this uh, uh, process a whole lot simpler. So if I delete this and delete this, I can do away with the server-side code that's embedded in my view. And to take a look at what the menu item does, I mean, it's pretty much what uh, the view was doing. Um, helpers, menu item helper. We should have code that's basically built in an HTML string, which takes into account, am I in the right controller, am I on the right action? And if so, then I'm the selected tab. That's basically what we're going to have there. Now, the last part of this uh, presentation, it's basically uh, just viewing how simple a view engine can be defined within our code. And if you look at um, the code that I have in the system right now, I did build a very silly uh, view engine for you guys. Yeah, my browser, my app, my computer is definitely not going as fast as I am. But again, this is the menu item helper, basically building a string. It's extending the default HTML helpers and returning a value to the view. And this is code you can test. That's uh, the premier value of it without having to build an integration test. So the view engine, and I do have something here in the views engine folder that I would like to highlight. I have a view engine itself, which is just a uh, extension of the virtual path provider view engine class, where I'm saying, hey, you're now going to have views that, are, that have that extension dot token and can be located using this format. Now, the default view that a token based view engine just uses is the token based view. Now, needless to say, this is not a Spark view engine, so this is a pretty simple example. And the view itself, just um, iterates through the property of the model that is being passed and just replaces the value that it encounters on the text file that is the view. So basically what we have is, as the name states, a token-based value view engine. And to show you what that might look like, the email has a detailed token that's a implementation of that view engine. If I double click on it, I have an HTML, a head, a body, and basically some tokens that are going to be replaced by the view. And that actually is working. Um, I believe, let me add one real quick. So new email, RobertoHernandezAtExcel.com. Create should work. Mm, I think the cache is hurting me there. Uh, 
Well, I could actually trick it. I mean, right now it's getting cached. That's why I'm not seeing the information here. But if I actually do email detail one, I should be able to land at that view and get the very ugly rendering that was uh, the output of my token-based view engine. Now, again, it's not Spark View Engine, it's just a demo. And it's meant to highlight how easy it can be to extend a view engine. You could use it for very different uh, reasons. In fact, on a recent project, uh, some people I know used it for routing the appropriate request to a view that was designed for either mobile or for uh, rendering on a, uh, um, uh, let's just call it a real browser. So with that, um, my presentation is uh, complete. Uh, I don't know if we actually have time for a lot of questions and answers, but I would definitely uh, like to spend a couple of minutes uh, uh, answering questions. And the information on this slide is basically uh, where you would find me if you need to fire away an email to basically get more information about MVC extensibility. This presentation was recorded at MVC Comp. For more content like this, go to www.mvcconf.com.